Freedom Back Tool. The show that rewards the one who can best misuse Bible verses. Let's meet our contestants. Now, Helen, it says here that your favorite thing about the Bible is using it to make yourself seem right. Tell us about that. Yes, well, I just get so much joy knowing how proud God is of me, and I use scripture so that everyone will know it. Uh, That brings us to Doug. Uh, He enjoys asking intelligent questions and rational thought. Doug, tell us why you're a downer. I'm not a downer. I'm not a downer. I just don't think verses should be used Uh, by... uh, Don't judge me or you two will be judged. Oh, double points for both rudely interrupting and misusing scripture. (laughs) For that, Helen gets to use all of her stone-slinging skills to throw Bible verses at Doug's face. (laughs) Well, it looks like Helen is extending her lead, but when it comes to misusing scripture, it's anybody's game here on... (laughs) We'll be back after this sermon from a pastor. (laughs) Well, we are in the second week of the sermon series, and I'm excited to dive in here with you uh, to this verse today, um, or this passage, I guess. This series is called Twisted, as you saw on the screen there. And what we're doing is we are looking at some of the Um, what I'd call most misused verses in the Bible. And today we're going to look at probably what is the number one most uh, quoted Bible verse by people who are not Christians, right? Um, One of the most popular verses even among Christians, for that matter, to be quoted. And it's from Matthew 7, um, verses 1 through 2. Uh, We'll talk about 3, 4, and 5 as well a little bit. But Matthew 7, 1 through 2 is going to be the focus. So if you want to follow along, there are some pew Bibles. You'll see it on the screen. iPhones, iPads, Kindles, nooks, whatever you got. If it's got a Bible in it, it's fair game. Open it up uh, to Matthew 7, and we'll, we'll be hovering there. For the most part, I'll have a few other verses for support, but uh, that's mostly what you're going to see today. So Matthew 7, 1 through 2, and, and these are the, the words of Jesus here, okay? So you've probably heard the King James Version the most, so well, I don't normally use that. I'll, I'll quote that one to you because it's the one you're familiar with, probably. And, and King James says, judge not, lest ye be judged, right? You all have heard that. Um, Don't judge or you two are going to be judged. Now, people who don't even believe in the Bible know this verse, right? Boy, don't they. Um, They they, they know this verse and and they'll say it with attitude, right? Judge not, lest ye be judged. Don't judge me or I get to judge you, right? You'll hear that. I I hear it from my friends who I know are not Christians. Um, You'll you'll see it. I hear it. It it comes up in conversation. Um, Jesus says, don't judge or you'll be judged. But then in verse 2 he says, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. With the same measure it will be used to measure you. So in other words, you have no right to tell me how to live, right? I'm going to do with my life whatever I want to do, however I want to do it. You do with your life what you want to do. And you're a sinner anyhow, right? It doesn't matter what I do as long as it makes me happy. As long as it doesn't hurt somebody else, what's wrong with what I'm doing, right? Judge not, lest ye be judged. Don't judge me or I get to judge you, right? And and I'm going to argue today that this is one of the most pervasive values in our culture. Tolerate everything, right? Every kind of behavior, every kind of belief system. You have no right whatsoever to say what I'm doing is wrong. Don't judge or you'll be judged. Now, let's be honest. It does stink to be judged, doesn't it? Right? How many of you have ever been judged wrongly by somebody? How many of you have ever judged somebody else wrongly? Right? It's not fun, is it? It's not. And and it's no secret that this theme is probably the number one thing that drives non-Christians away from the church. This theme, that judgmental theme. You ever ever bump into this? I know I bump into this. I, I see it on Facebook a lot. Where where people are like, Christians are so judgmental, right? Yeah? And I know some of you are a little bit older, but you're still on Facebook. You probably see it like I see it. They're so narrow-minded, right? I have a bunch of friends who are 
pretty liberal. I have a bunch that aren't, but I have a bunch that are. Wildly liberal, in fact. I have a bunch of friends that live out in Seattle, and they're crazy liberal. Um, and, and, and I get a lot of pushback from them because they're not Christians. You know, and if you follow my Facebook feed, I'm a pastor. It's pretty obvious. So I, I take some heat. I take some flack. And they're like, you're so narrow-minded. You're such a hypocrite, right? You ever get that one? Because you're a Christian, you're a hypocrite. Right? You're such a hypocrite. Christians are so judgmental, is what they'll tell me. By the way, and they'll always remind you, Jesus said, don't judge her, you'll be judged. Judge not, lest you be judged, right? I mean, even Metallica put it in a song. If you don't know Metallica, it, it's in one of their songs. So judge not, lest you be judged. Now, is that exactly what Jesus meant when he said it? I mean, in other words, if, if that's true, if that is what Jesus actually meant, at least in the way that they're saying it means. I mean, what teacher then has a right to decide whether I get an A or a B or a C or a D on my paper, right? You can't judge me. That was a work that I did two minutes before class in the hallway on a locker, right? That was A quality cheating off of somebody else's test, right? You can't judge me for that. You have no right to judge me. And if we take it at face value, then how could a jury ever find anybody to be wrong? How, how could the court systems ever hold anybody accountable for a crime? I mean, who are you to say if I'm innocent or guilty? Right? And if a police officer wants to come and tell me I'm driving on the wrong side of the road, what right does he have? I like this side of the road better. It's more entertaining. It's more interesting. There's less traffic over on this side of the road. <laughs> See, everybody gets out of my way on this side. I'm driving on that side. I've got to follow people. This side, they all get out of my way. Right? Who are you to judge me? You have no right to tell me what to do or how to live my life. Now, I think we would all agree that at some level, we're going to have to make some judgment calls, Right? So I'll ask you a few questions and let you think about it here. This is meant to be a little tricky. So for example, this is not rooted in any reality, so don't, nobody take offense. But for example, are we allowed to judge somebody's funny haircut? Right? Are we? Can we judge that? Like you're looking at them going, oh, I can't believe you did that. Right? What do you think? Can we judge that? I mean, if, if that person sitting next to you right now, don't look at them, keep looking forward. <laughs> Eyes up here. But can we judge somebody's bad haircut? Or maybe it's just a style that we don't like. Do we get to judge that? I don't know. Who are you to judge? Well, how about uh, we're at work? And this guy is just like, He's like really flirty, right? He just like flirts with everybody in the office. And it's not like just casual flirting. I mean, this guy's, he's like, I think he's trying to find a date. Do I get to judge him? How about if I know he's a Christian? How about if I know his wife? Do I get to judge him? Do I have the right to speak into his life? Or are we never to judge? Or how about this one? Our culture says, this is one of our culture values, you can have sex with anybody you want to, right? That's what our culture says. You aren't allowed to judge somebody else's life for who they choose to have intimate relationships with, right? Can we have limits there? Are, are, are we allowed to judge there? It's complicated, isn't it? But it's important that we get this right. Judge not, lest ye be judged. What exactly does that mean? Now, some of you were here last week. I want to do a quick little review. 
If you were here last week, you'll remember I went through a, a brief kind of teaching to help you uh, understand how we accurately interpret and understand Scripture. And we talked about three things. I'm just going to hit these thousand foot level real quick. We talked about three things last week. Number one, we talked about understanding the context of Scripture. Okay? We want to know who wrote it, why did they write it, to whom were they writing to, what comes before the verse, what comes after the verse. Because, see, we don't want to just pull a single verse out of context. We want to understand the Scripture that we're reading within context. We'll talk about that in a little minute, about this verse. The second thing we talked about last week, we talked about the best way to interpret Scripture is with other Scripture. Is, is to find what does the rest of the Bible say about this subject, right? The best way to interpret the Bible is with the Bible. In other words, we're not just going to interpret it with our feelings or with our experiences. The best way to interpret the Bible is with the Bible. We're not going to build a theology based on a single verse. We're going to see what does the whole of Scripture have to say about the subject. We're going to look at the topic overall. We're going to look at the totality of what God says through his word, and then we'll base our theology on that. And then the third thing, this is important, the third thing is we're not just going to be students of the word, but we're going to be doers of the word. We're going to apply what it is we read. the, the, The Bible, the greatest book ever written, is completely worthless if it doesn't make us change and transform and make a difference in our lives. We may as well not read it. Just sticking it in our head doesn't get us anywhere unless we go out with our hands and feet into the world and live it. Right? So we have to be doers of the word, as Scripture tells us. Live it out. It's not just a text to be studied, but it's a letter to be lived. Right? So let's try to do that with this text. Matthew 7, 1 through 2. The context, okay? Well, what comes before Matthew chapter 7? In Matthew chapter 6, one of the big themes we find there is hypocrisy. Jesus was railing on the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. In verse 2, in verse 5, and in verse 16. He's dealing with hypocrisy. And the flow of teaching as Jesus is talking is this theme of hypocrisy. And so when we get to Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, Do not judge. And then later on in that very same chapter, he says, watch out, be on your guard, be aware of false prophets, Jesus says. So now you've got to go, wait, hold on a second. What do you mean? I'm not allowed to judge, but I've got to judge whether somebody's going to be a false prophet? What do I do here? I've got to be able to judge that a person's not from God? But you said, don't judge Jesus. Hmm, interesting, huh? And what I want to show you very clearly today is that Jesus is not telling us that we should live without discernment. We have to have discernment. He's not telling us that we never have the right to speak into the lives of others' believers. What he's telling us is that we need to be very, very careful and never judge hypocritically. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. The same measure that you judge others with, you will also be measured, says Jesus. And in context, then he goes on to say, if you're following and reading along, he says, why do you look at a speck of sawdust? Right? Now, I've had a speck of sawdust get in my eye. It's irritating. It's annoying. But I could still see and he says, why, when you've got this little speck of sawdust in your eye, why, why, are you, why, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, I mean? Why do you look at this speck when you've got like a log? You've got a two-by-four sticking out of your own, right? He's like, you've got this big old plank in your eye. How can you say to your brother, take a look at your speck when you've got some lumber? hanging out of your face. You hypocrite! Right? The big theme in this teaching is more about the hypocrisy than it is about the judgment. Jesus says, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, he says. 
then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother. In other words, Jesus says, look in the mirror first, right? Don't pick apart other people's lives. Don't pick apart other people's faults when you've got some big issues going on in your own. He's saying, don't judge hypocritically. In fact, that is the context of what he's speaking about. Well, how about then if we let Scripture interpret Scripture, that second point I made. Jesus says this in John 7, 24. And again, this is Jesus talking. He says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So don't judge with surface appearances, but dig deeper and judge rightly. Jesus says, there is a time to judge, and when you judge, judge accurately, judge correctly. But please do not judge merely by appearances. Now, none of us, right, would ever judge somebody else by their appearances, would we? No. Never done that before, right? That ever bit you before? You judge somebody, the clothes they wear, the way they speak, the car they drive, right? And all of a sudden you realize, hmm, this isn't who I thought it was. I had a, a good friend years ago, and uh, his name was Art. And Art was, well, personally, probably the richest man I've ever met as a person. So Art had great wealth, but they never showed it. He, he drove a 15, 20-year-old car. His wife drove an Oldsmobile Bravada that was half worn out. And you would never know if you met Art walking down the sidewalk that this guy had a penny to his name. He was a hardworking guy. He liked to work with his hands. He liked to remodel houses. He looked like a construction worker half the time, right? He was wearing, you know, torn up clothes and knees ripped out of his pants because he was over at some apartment that he had bought that he was remodeling because that's what Art did. But if he walked into your store dressing like that and you didn't know, you might not pay him any mind. This is a guy who could walk in and pay cash for a Ferrari if he wanted. Right? I mean, seriously, he, he was, he's the second largest benefactor to my college. He's that level of wealth. But he didn't care about worldly things. And so it's easy, if you didn't know Art personally, first time I would have met him, I, had I not known who he was from a friend, I probably wouldn't have paid him any mind either. I would have missed a great opportunity to meet a fantastic man who was incredibly generous to the, to the work of God and his kingdom. Because I would have judged him as some sloppily dressed middle-aged guy who I probably have nothing in common with because I was a college kid. Right? So we do that. We, we, we look at somebody. We make surface evaluations. Even though we know we shouldn't. And Jesus tells us we should never judge superficially. Paul also teaches that we should never judge hypocritically. He teaches us this in Romans 2. And in fact, when he's talking to the Romans believers, he's telling them, hey guys, when you're pointing out the sins in other people's lives, you need to understand that oftentimes the very same sin is present in your own life. And then Paul says, be careful. Right? Right? Paul says in Romans 2, verses 1 and 4, he says, You may think you condemn such people, but you're just as bad. You have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are therefore condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. But then it gets interesting, because in verse 4, Paul kind of changes his tone. And, and we hear this interesting grace now come into the conversation. And, and Paul changes the conversation with grace and he brings it with passion and intensity. And he says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, how tolerant and how patient God is with you? And in other words, he's saying, why are you picking them apart? God has been gracious to you. And if God has been gracious to you, then you need to extend that very same grace to someone else. Don't judge hypocritically. We tend to accuse others and excuse ourselves, don't we? We do. We accuse others 
but we excuse ourselves. You ever had an argument with your spouse? You know this is true, right? We accuse others, we excuse ourselves. But that's not how it's supposed to be. Extend the grace that has been given to you. One of my regular prayers in my own personal prayer life is God, don't let me be the stopping point of your grace. Let me not be the kink in the hose of the grace of God. God has poured his grace into my life so abundantly and so graciously. Let me not stop that flow. I want that hose wide open. I want it to flow as fast as it came into me, out of me. Let me not be the stopping point of God's grace. And here's a bonus point for you today. And a point that many of us as Christians get wrong. This is incredibly important. This is something we all struggle with. But we are not as Christians to hold non-Christians to our Christian standards. That's tough, isn't it? We're not supposed to hold the people outside of the family to the rules for those of us who are inside the family. Now yes, we, we can ask that they behave in a specific way when they come and join us for worship. That's okay. But to expect the world to live like the church? It doesn't work that way. Should it surprise us when the world lives like the world? No. That should be what we expect it to do, right? In fact, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 5.12. He says, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside of the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. So if they aren't Christ's followers, let us not be surprised when they live that way. If they are within the family, sure, we need to address sin. We need to let iron sharpen iron. Within the family, we spur one another on to good works. We're to restore gently a brother or a sister who has fallen away. We are to help our family. But if someone's outside of our family of God, we don't get to hold them accountable to the Christian family rules. That's not our place to judge. That's God's. And this is probably one of the number one reasons why so many non-Christians step away from ever pursuing a relationship with God. Because of judgmentalism, because of hypocrisy, because Christian believers who apply a set of rules to their lives that they don't want to live by. Right? I was there. I remember being a non-Christian. I became a Christian as an adult. I remember being judged. Heck, I remember after I came to faith, still being judged, frankly. Six months after, well, not even six months, probably six weeks after I became a Christian, I was on my first missions trip, spring break, in central Mexico. And I guarantee you, almost every person in the van, including the pastor who was leading it, was not convinced I knew Jesus. Okay? Because they knew me before I knew Jesus. And I wasn't always the best. So I, I, I kind of can relate. I, I felt that, that burn before. And it turns people off, frankly. And it, it, it turns people away, frankly. The very people who need Jesus most. We're trying to apply a set of rules they, they don't want to live by. We're judging them when it's not our place to judge. We're erecting barriers for their faith that don't need to be barriers in their lives. We're keeping them from coming to know the grace of God. This is real stuff. The church is to be a hospital for the broken and for the hurting. Not an art gallery for those who look good on the outside. Remember what Jesus called those people? So they're, they're, they're like whitewashed tombs, right? You took some white paint, you slapped it on the outside, but inside, there's stink, there's decay, there's death. 
We don't want to be like that. Because we are all sinners in need of a Savior. We just happen to already know that Savior. Right? We got an advantage. We need to put our arms around those people and say, we're both homeless and we don't, we don't have anything to eat, but I know somebody who got food. Let's go, let me take you over here and get you what you need. That's what the Bible's talking about. We're all simple beggars, broken. We just know the source. And we've got to share that. And we shouldn't hold those outside of the family accountable to God's standards. Because they're unwilling to be accountable to God's standards. It's God's place to deal with them, not our place. Our place is to love them. Our place is to serve them. Our place is to enter into relationship with them, to be a lighthouse into their lives. Are you hearing me? This is vital if we want to be a church that makes disciples and grows God's family. My final point today is this. We must also, along the way, always help restore fallen believers. Always help restore fallen believers. And, and the reason for this is, is so important. Because at some point, we're all going to fall, aren't we? How many of you lived without sin this week? Right? At some level, we're all going to need to be restored. Now, sure, you might not have an affair this week. You might not embezzle a million dollars this week. You might not kill somebody this week. Right? Right? We don't all fail publicly and spectacular each and every week. But we're all still in need of grace. We're all still in need of forgiveness. We're all still in need of correction. We all still need to be rebuked for righteousness. All of it to God's glory. And because of that, because we love our brothers and sisters too much to let them continuing on down this path of life that we know leads to destruction. We need to restore them gently. We don't kick them when they're down. Right? We love them. We work to restore them. We say, hey, I see this going on in your life. It shouldn't be this way. Let me work with you. Let's get you back on course. Let's get you heading back towards the cross here. We don't abandon them. We don't let them just continue on without correction. We go to them and say, brother, sister, I see this. Let's fix this. Here's what Paul says in Galatians 6, 1 through 2. Don't miss this. He says, brothers, if anyone is caught in transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too also may be tempted. Bear with one another the burdens so that you fulfill the law of Christ. What was the law of Christ? Love one another. Right? Paul's talking to us brothers and sisters in faith. And we agree that within the family of God, this is our rule book. Right? And it's okay for somebody in the family for us to go within that context to be a little judgmental. But, Paul says, be careful lest you too be judged. It's easy for me to come and say, Bill, ha, 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 boy, you're, shouldn't have done that. And all of a sudden, pride creeps in. I would never do that. I'm better than you, Bill. Right? Paul's warning us. Be careful. Be careful. We do get to judge. We do get to help correct with gentleness. We have to help bear the other's burden with gentleness. But be careful because it can quickly get off track. We don't kick them when we're down. 
we come alongside of them and help lift them back up. Let me wrap this up before I lose my voice here. Let me tell you right now as Jesus followers that this is how we are to do it. That very same grace that forgives us is the very same grace that we use to restore others. That is how we are to do it in the family of God. We don't pretend like it didn't happen. We don't kick people when they're down. We love them back into fellowship. If someone is caught into sin, we call it a sin. It may not be popular in the world today, but that's what we call it, sin. But then we don't kick them while they're down. We love them gently back in grace and truth because that is the kind of God that we serve. That same grace that has been given to us we give it to others as we use the truth to bring them back onto the path of righteousness. The truth of Jesus is what sets people free. And that's how we have to go about doing our business. As we interpret God's word, as we take Jesus into the world, we need to be a people who bring healing. We need to be a people who bring restoration. We need to be a people who help people find the same kind of grace that transformed you and me. The loving kindness of God, which brings people to repentance. This week as you go, take that grace into the world. Love those who need to be loved rather than judge them. Do that, and you can change the world one person at a time. Amen.